Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the sympathetic nervous system and its effect on the heart. Okay, right. So, uh, what I now want to discuss, before we go into the details of how noradrenaline being released onto cardiomyocytes actually uh, produces an increase in uh, the uh, force of contraction that the cardiomyocytes can generate, what I want to do is give you the big picture of how we are actually going to increase the force of contraction of the heart. And then we'll look at the specifics, i.e. we'll look at the signaling pathway associated with noradrenaline. So basically what I want to do now is look at how do we actually increase the force with which a cardiomyocyte contracts. And then we'll look at the specifics of how noradrenaline uh, does what we're now going to talk about. So. Uh, in order to do this, I'm going to need some more paper, uh, well, a bit more room, basically. Uh, so, basically, um, it's going to increase the um, amplitude of the calcium spikes that you get in the cardiomyocytes. But in order to discuss this further, we need to have a little bit of re revision of how you couple excitation to the contraction of the cardiomyocyte. And for this, the science is different in ventricular myocytes versus atrial myocytes because atrial myocytes do not have T-tubules, okay? So here, let's say this is an atrial myocyte, okay? And here, uh, which we'll draw here, I think, let's say this is a ventricular myocyte. Okay, right. Now, the main difference between the atrial and the ventricular myocyte is that the ventricular myocyte has T-tubules. It has these invaginations of the sarcolemma, which is just a fancy word for the cell membrane. So the fancy word for the cell membrane of a muscle cell is to call it the sarcolemma. Okay. Now, in uh, ventricular myocytes, you have these invaginations of the sarcolemma inwards, which are known as T-tubules, which stands for transverse tubule. So this T stands for transverse, and transverse just means uh, perpendicular to, basically, so orthogonal. Uh, so it means that this invagination is perpendicular to the normal plane of the sarcolemma, basically. So if you want to have a good intuition for what a T-tubule is, Think of a balloon, and the surface of the balloon is uh, analogous to the sarcolemma, the cell membrane. And if you dig your fingers into the balloon, you press them into the balloon, then you're going to get these invaginations of that surface of the balloon into uh, the vacuum within the balloon. Well, not a vacuum, but, you know, the space within the balloon. Um, and uh, that is analogous to what these T-tubules are. They're these invaginations, these finger-like invaginations into the membrane of uh, the cardiomyocyte. So this here is a cardiomyocyte from the ventricles, so a ventricular myocyte, okay? And this one without T-tubules, this is an atrial myocyte. And it's important that we discuss both of them because the mechanisms by which uh, we increase inotropy in both of them are very, very similar, but it's slightly more dramatic in the atrial myocyte because the atrial myocyte doesn't have these T-tubules. So we'll start with the ventricular myocyte because it's more familiar generally to people. So basically what happens, let's revise excitation contraction coupling, what happens is that when an action potential propagates down the T-tubule, it will cause the activation of L-type voltage-gated calcium channels, which are in uh, the membrane of the cell. So here is this L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, which we'll colour in purple here. Okay, so this is an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, for short, VGCC. Okay, and L-type voltage-gated calcium channels are also referred to as dihydropyridine receptors because they are sensitive to the drugs which are called dihydropyridines. Okay, uh, of which an example is nifedipine. Okay, so dihydropyridine receptor. And dihydropyridine receptor is often abbreviated to DH for dihydro, P for pyridine, R for receptor, so DHPR. 
So you might see this terminology used instead of uh, the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. Now, what's going to happen is that calcium is far higher in the extracellular fluid than it is in the cytoplasm, basically. It's around 1.5 millimolar in the uh, extracellular fluid, and it's at around 100 nanomolar in the intracellular fluid. So when you open this L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, there is a 15,000-fold gradient of calcium favoring the movement of calcium inwards. In addition, it, when you factor in the electrical potential difference that is generally across this membrane, the normal electrical potential difference across the membrane is usually around negative 85 millivolts. Of course, you'll be disturbing that because an action potential is occurring here. Um, but the point is that there's 15,000-fold gradient of calcium into the cell, so you get movement of calcium into the cell. So a few calcium ions move from the extracellular fluid into the cytoplasm of uh, this cell, like so. Okay. Now, that causes a local rise in calcium nearby this L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. And that rise in calcium, that calcium signal, actually is so important that it has its own name. It's known as a calcium sparklet. So a calcium sparklet is the name given to the calcium signal produced by an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel when it lets calcium into a cardiomyocyte. Okay. Now, calcium going up in the cytoplasm is actually what triggers contraction of the cardiomyocyte. However, really, really important concept in all of cardiac physiology it is not the calcium that comes in for a calcium sparklet, uh, well, through multiple calcium sparklets, that causes uh, the contraction of the cardiomyocyte. This calcium signal is not big enough to cause the contraction of the cardiomyocyte. It's pathetic, basically. So what we need to do is potentiate it. We need to make it bigger. So what we get is we get a phenomenon known as calcium-induced calcium release, where this initial calcium signal coming in through the L-type voltage-gated calcium channels is going to induce the release of calcium from the intracellular stores in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And that then, that release of the calcium from the intracellular stores is going to create a much bigger calcium signal that will then cause the contraction of the cardiomyocyte. So basically, we need to amplify this signal up to make it big enough to actually cause the cardiomyocyte to contract. So, what you have is you have projections from this intracellular organelle called the sarcoplasmic reticulum with the uh, membrane of the T-tubules and also with the membrane or also with the plasma membrane of the cell. So, with the sarcolemma up here, you also have connections like so. So basically, the uh, endoplasmic reticulum forms lots of these sort of little processes which project off and sort of um, adhere against the cell membrane, whether it's in a T-tubule or whether it's uh, not in a T-tubule. Okay, and now this structure here where you've got the cell membrane and then it's facing onto the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So by the way, this organelle here, this is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, SR for short. So SR in full means sarcoplasmic reticulum. Sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, right. Uh, so, um, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is an intracellular store of calcium. It has a high calcium level within it, much higher than you have in the cytoplasm. Okay, now, this structure when you have the um, plasma membrane facing the membrane of the SR, this is known as a calcium synapse. So this entire structure here, we've got one membrane and then another here, this is what's known as a calcium synapse, which is a very important concept in calcium signaling. So this is a calcium synapse. And the reason it's called a calcium synapse is because this plasma membrane, or this sarcolemma here, is going to release calcium into this cleft between the two membranes, which actually has a name. That cleft is known as the dyadic cleft, the space between the plasma membrane and the sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane is known as the dyadic cleft. 
okay? So you have this space between those two membranes known as the dyadic cleft. The calcium that comes in from the extracellular space, this calcium sparklet, is now going to act on receptors that are in the membrane of the SR. And when it binds to those receptors, it's going to cause them to open, and they'll release calcium from the SR. Okay, so here, then, is this receptor that the calcium is going to act on. Okay, and I'll colour this in turquoise. Okay, so in turquoise here is the receptor that the calcium is going to act on. And that receptor is the type 2 ryanodine receptor. Type 2 ryanodine receptor. Ryanodine receptor. Which is often abbreviated to the RYR, standing for ryanodine, RY for ryanodine, R for receptor, and then you put two in Roman numerals afterwards to denote that it's the second type of the ryanodine receptor. Now, let's just have a little bit of a discussion about the type 2 ryanodine receptor. Uh, but in fact, we'll do that in the next video.